Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here with Philippe J. Fournier for this week's episode of the Numbers Podcast. Uh, Philippe, was it a late night for you on Tuesday? <laughs> it was a it was a long day of doing uh, media and finishing up the column, the, 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 the calculations for the model. But uh, I bailed out. I would say before midnight. Uh, we saw the results. We saw the trends. We understood. I think many people did where it was going. And I was, you know, I had a good excuse. I was teaching early Wednesday morning. Uh, this is my number one job, being a teacher in college. And so I, I didn't want to be uh, completely wrecked uh, by doing that. I, I can't have a four or five hour night sleep before teaching. So I bailed out before midnight. But when I woke up, obviously, I checked my phone. And it was pretty much what we had seen the night prior. Uh, what about you, Eric? How did you, uh, how did you spend uh, election night? Uh, uh, did, were you at home? Yeah, and I watched it for a lot longer than um, <laughs> than I wondered what was going to happen. I guess I could say it that way. Um, uh, it was pretty obvious pretty early that yeah. things weren't breaking in the way that was going to work for Kamala Harris. You could, it, it, it's one of those things you get used to doing after you've watched a lot of these kinds of elections, is that you you look for those signs, right? Yeah. There was some initial signs at the beginning of the night. There was good results for Harris in the Indianapolis area. Yeah. But that was about it. That was the only time during the night that it was like, okay, this is heading in that direction. And it just became pretty obvious pretty early. It was almost just like just going through the motions just to make sure that uh, that um, the way the count unfolds continues in the way that it was expected to unfold. And it did. And it was it seemed a lot more obvious that it was going to be Trump who was going to win a lot earlier than I think some of the networks were yeah. starting to talk about it. I mean, they're they're playing it safe, of course. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. But it if if anybody was on the Discord with me uh, on uh, on Tuesday night, we all decided it was pretty over <laughs> pretty early, and the New York yeah. Times uh, needle uh, guided us uh, pretty clearly that night. So um, this is a Canadian politics podcast, so we're not going to spend. A huge amount of time on the actual results or anything like that but we did want to talk about the thing that is in our lane yep the polls yeah and you wrote about it so i, I might actually just let you lead on this how did the polls do in okay. the u.s election okay so something that i want to say to preface this answer is that there is so much to analyze in these elections there's so much happening the, the differences between the state and the presidential race. And uh, there's like, we're talking about Latinos and black voters. And you know, there's so much to analyze. So I think we have to go by layers. And I took the, the low hanging fruit. I wrote a column for L'Actualité. For those who read French, I invite you, uh, I posted it on social media. It's basically, when you look at the results, it, it was a bad defeat for Kamala Harris. But again, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, were all decided by a point or so. And so it was close, <laughs> right? It was really close, except that when you look at New Jersey and Colorado and Illinois, you know, blue states that should have been bluer, that were not, well, they were, they were decided to be blue, but they were closer than expected. So it was an underperformance. What I wrote about is basically here are, for Pennsylvania, the final polls from the major firms. And let's look at the result. So, I mean, I invite people to go read it, but we are on a podcast. I have the table right in front of me. So, you know, you take the the, the, the New York Times, CNN, the morning consults and all the major polling firms. Here was what uh, the numbers were for Donald Trump. 46, 47, 47, 47, 48, 48, 48, 48, 49, 49, 49, 50. And right now, as of this recording, he had 50.4. And for Kamala Harris, it was between 47 and 51, and she has 49. So did the polls get it right? Yeah, they did. It's just that there was a small, we say in French, la prime allure, the ballot box bonus, mm -hmm. I think would be the best translation. Like the, all the polls in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania were within range of the results, but Trump was always on the upper bracket, right? Yeah. Um, and so... I, I, I'm waiting for final results in other states because there were states that were missed. Nevada was missed. Nevada, I think, uh, has a four-point gap between the two, and it was supposed to be a tie, um, and it really wasn't. But for those three states that decided the election, if you take the current map, Eric, and you flip Wisconsin-Michigan by Pennsylvania, uh, she wins. 
and um, but she she didn't, and uh, we have a, a second Trump term. Uh, so this is this is the the analysis that I did. Uh, I know again many layers you could dig into like counties and what happened in Philadelphia and and such, but the state polls of the main states that were battlegrounds did okay. It was it was good. It's just it was within range. Yeah, the error that was made in 2020 and in 2016 was repeated a little bit, but not as much, yeah. right? Because based on when all the votes are going to get counted, they still got lost to count in like California, for example. Yeah. Trump looks like he'll win the popular vote maybe by one point and a half. And the last polls more or less had it as a tie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My exactly. average had, I think, a point one advantage for Harris in the national <laughs> polling. Yeah. So the error is looks like it's going to be a little bit around two points, like an underestimation of Trump by two points, which is a lot better than in 2016, obviously, where it was, what was the error? Something like eight points. And and in 2020, where the error was not as bad as in 2016, but was still yeah. uh, not really, I would say, acceptable. This was a good performance for the polls. Uh, but as you said, in all of the states, you know, you look at, at Harris's numbers, she was always somewhere in between. It's like the polls knew how to do the Democrats correctly. Yeah. For Trump, it was always that he was at the higher end. Yeah. He always matched his best poll. He, it wasn't that he beat his polls, you know, he, yeah. but he, he, he matched his best polls. So there's a question there that uh, I think is interesting. There was talk from Democrats that it seemed they thought turnout was going to be really good for them in certain areas. And there's some indication that maybe, maybe it wasn't what they were hoping it to be. So maybe that yeah. is something behind it. And as you said, with those other states, some of the other ones, the polls did not do very well, but there weren't that many, right? Yeah, but the exactly. the gaps in, you know, New York and like you said, Illinois, New Jersey, states yeah. like that, were a lot closer than was uh, was expected. If you look at the error in the polls, the most significant errors were in states that people weren't really polling very much. Exactly. Which maybe is an indication of the fact that people weren't polling very much. But um, so I I, I think. What we thought could happen, that Trump would beat his polls once again, yeah. happened a bit. It does seem like uh, pollsters did a decent job calibrating to try to avoid the errors of the past. But uh, this is the kind of overperformance we would say is more of a, maybe more of an organizational, a turnout differential, that kind of thing, rather than a, a systemic error in the polls. I think that yeah. would be my view on, on how things played out. And shout out to uh, Canadian pollsters. That uh, I mean, Leger had a, his final poll for uh, the New York Post was 49-49 in the popular vote, and it looks like it will be like 50 to 48 point something. It, it, I mean, it's right on the nose. So mm -hmm. congratulations! I remember seeing that poll from Leger is like, if it's tied at the popular vote, Trump will win, right? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. But the state polls again, uh, in the I mean, I focus on the swing states, right? I mean, I did not have North Carolina or Georgia or Arizona going blue. The polls yeah. were close, but they were always pretty much on the same side. Uh, I think it, it came down to Wimipa, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. I mean, again, look at I mean, I look at the um, Wisconsin, forty nine point six for Donald Trump as of this recording, and forty eight point eight. That's less than a point. Uh, and my final projection for Wisconsin was uh, was forty nine forty eight the other way, so I mean, again, it's it's this was well within range. There, for me, there was no surprise when I released my final projection. I was like, I you know, Trump will probably win because the numbers say it's a toss up, and if it's a toss up against Trump, I mean, when Biden beat Trump in twenty twenty, I published uh, my final projection in McLean's. Uh, the odds were 80-20. And <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm pretty confident that Biden's going to win. 80-20 should be, you know, pretty good odds. And still it was close. You cannot just beat Trump. You have to beat him cleanly because he has like that one little point that you're missing from the polls. Um, so, yeah. So, anyway, I think mostly it was a good night for the pollsters. Mostly. Uh, we'll have to revisit. I, as I said, I'm waiting for the final results in Nevada. I think Nevada was one of those states that was missed. Uh, mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll talk about this later when we have the full, uh, the full state of results. I think, I think there's also the perception uh, that because the Electoral College victory is going to be pretty, pretty, broad, pretty wide, yeah. Yeah. that it looks like it wasn't 
a close race. But we had talked about it before, and I saw, I saw many people uh, commenting on it before the election, was that because it was close, if there was a uniform overperformance or underperformance by one of the candidates, yeah. all of those swing states could go in the same direction. Yep. And that is what's going to happen. Yep. Uh, that, you know, it, when it comes down to it, we're probably going to be able to find that only, you know, a few tens of thousands of votes made the difference. Uh, and it could have gone the other way. So it still was a close election. Uh, but um, but definitely it was a pretty broad based uh, win for Trump. The fact that it looks like he'll get over half of the vote, yep. um, which uh, no Republican has done since uh, George Bush, George W. Bush in 2004. So. Yeah. You know, it was it was it wasn't a uh, an asterisk win as in 2016 <laughs> when the popular vote uh, went to Hillary Clinton. I so wanna, that is, if I can have one last thing about this, because I, I looked at uh, my uh, presidential projection in mid July, just before Joe mm -hmm. Biden announced that he would not run again, and it was at the seat count or the electoral co college count. It was 312 for Trump and 226 for Biden, and that will be the final result in the Electoral College. So Kamala Harris came in. She had momentum at first. She could not. Like, she, she basically did what we had for Biden in mid-July, which I think is so telling. But uh, yeah, so you know, my last you know what word it tells me? You know mm -hmm. what it tells me? Mm -hmm. we, and we can now link this to Canadian politics, is that a change of leader at the last minute might sometimes help, <laughs> might boost your polls. <laughs> But often yeah. voters end up reverting to just where they were before. We saw it yep. with Kim Campbell and Brian Mulroney. We saw it with John Turner and Pierre Trudeau. Uh, so maybe that is what's going to what happened here. Uh, you almost need the election to be like right after you switch, right? <laughs> because then yeah. people don't go back to where they were before. So let's make that pivot to Canada. Yes, please. Uh, we, please. We got go lots ahead. of questions in the mailbag, and you know that'll be our special episode for our Patreons about what it means for Canada. But we can talk a little bit about it here because uh, the Angus Reid Institute had a poll that came out just before the election, and it asked who... Uh, so the question was, who would, who would have the best relationship when it comes best when it comes to dealing with Canada's overall relationship yeah. with the U.S.? They asked if Harris or if, if Trump were president, but if Trump were president... And on that question, 38% uh, of Canadians said it would be Pierre Poiliev, and 23% said it would be Justin Trudeau, which is pretty much the same as the na as national voting intentions, that, that kind of gap between the two leaders. Yeah. So I, it, well, the early indication would be that there's no particular reason to believe that the win in uh, the United States for Donald Trump is going to help or hurt one of the candidates no. here. The thing is, the, this this uh, poll from Angus Reid Institute, I mean, there was another section of that poll released just days prior, and it was the voting intentions. And the conservatives had doubled the support of the liberals. It was the, the conservatives were in the 40s, and the liberals were at 21. So when I look at these numbers, and I look, okay, so who, which leader would be best to deal with, you know, the relationship with the United States? And I see Trudeau leading for Kamala Harris and Trump leading with Poilievre, I'm not surprised, but I, that means that there are some voters that do not support the liberals that said, oh yeah, Trudeau and Harris would go along very well. Um, so I'm not sure how to interpret this. I'm not sure what it means. Maybe that doesn't mean anything. Or maybe it means that our our you know, electorate is not as polarized as the US, I, I think would be fair. We have to be careful with those assumptions, though. Um, but still, there was, you know, there was at least a third uh, of respondents that did not answer, said they don't know. And ask about who would have the best relationship with Donald Trump. Yeah, Poilievre had 38%, which is not a surprise, but there was 39% that either didn't answer or said, I don't know. Um, we have to be very careful. And I'm listening to a lot of you know, commentators and reading a lot of columnists that say, oh, what does this mean to Canada? Eric, I'm asking you, what does this mean to for Canada? What does this mean? This uh, what is what will happen after uh, Trump victory? Because I have an idea, and it's not it's very boring. So why don't you go first? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, don't there you know. go. That's what it is. But I think that's the difference. I think with uh, Harris and the Democrats, we would have known what to expect. Uh, would they be a bit protectionist? Would they maybe uh, have some 
demands when it comes to renegotiating NAFTA or Kuzmica or whatever the hell it is now. Uh, yes. <laughs> but predictability, I think, would have been the name of the game uh, with, a, with a Harris presidency. It's unpredictability and uncertainty that comes with a Trump presidency. And that's why I think that we don't know. And it could change from week to week. And well, so I think I think this is the I think this is the biggest wild card, the hugest wild card um, going into the next election is what will this mean for Canada? What events are going to happen that leaders have to react to? Uh, what crises are going to happen that leaders have to react to? I think that this could send things in any direction and it's impossible to make a prediction. Other than that, it is unpredictable. Well, that's the thing. And I don't think... Sh- had Kamala Harris won this, I don't think for a second that Miss Harris would not get along with Pierre, uh, Prime Minister Pierre Poilievre when that happens next year. I mean, it would have been strange that they don't keep those relationships. We have billions of goods and merchandise and trade going through the border every day. Uh, it would not happen. With Trump, though, uh, we don't know. I mean, we you know we got through the first term of Trump and you know, there were some ups and downs, but... It went relatively well, not for everybody. So that's why I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, to not have a huge opinion either way because the the real answer is we don't know. There's uh, careful of of people who say, oh, they know how it's gonna happen because they, you know, most likely don't. So and I don't. I don't pretend to uh, to know. So oh well. Why don't we move to the uh, entirely Canadian yes. portion of the show? <laughs> Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the latest federal numbers that have come out. Uh, we only had uh, two polls over yep. the last week. I think a lot of the pollsters were rightfully staying out of the way, yep. knowing that anything they put out was probably going to get buried. But we had a Nanos poll, the usual Nanos poll, 40 conservative, 24 liberal, 21 NDP. It looks a lot like a lot of other polls now, yep. after a couple of weeks where it had a, a smaller gap between the conservatives and the liberals. And then an Ecos poll mm. that had 37 for the conservatives, 25 for the liberals, 18 for the NDP. Um, <laughs> it was a bit of a wonky poll in the sense that... Uh, yeah. I mean, well, we'll talk. Okay, the overall numbers aren't that off from no. where everybody else is. No. But I mean, the the biggest issue was that there was a sample of what was it, thirty or forty people? Uh, it in was the prairies. Uh, yeah, it was thirty five. Thirty five. Thirty five, and it had the Liberals leading in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Yes, they're not leading in Saskatchewan, nope. Manitoba. We know they're not leading in Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. It's only uh, what is it, seven uh, percent of the entire population of yeah. the country. So doesn't really make that much of a difference but if you know you have to swing 20 points in the prairies to get a a reasonable number that adds maybe two points for the conservatives takes away two points from the liberals and then you're looking at the same kind of lead that we see from every other pollster so i'm not sure these neither of these numbers make me change my mind about anything happening in canadian politics right now what i do not understand about that ecos poll is that it's unfinished why why would you release this i mean there were 12 cases in manitoba eric the the sample size was about 1300 cases they interviewed 12 voters in manitoba so, so it's it's just unfinished right uh and i think it was 23 in the saskatchewan so again while we agree that It doesn't, please hear me out. I'm not saying that Manitoba and Saskatchewan don't matter. That's not what I'm saying, right? But it's true that. that. I think you pretty much said they should just disappear. (laughs) But in the overall picture. From there. In the overall (laughs) picture. It it doesn't matter much because, yeah, if, if there's a big swing in the overall picture, it won't matter. But. You choose when you release, right? And you choose when mm-hmm. you stop to sample. If you all have a poll and you only sample 12 people in Manitoba out of 1,300, your poll is not finished. Just take another day or two to take time to finish. This is, I, I mean, again, I'm a teacher. This is an unfinished assignment. This is an unfinished homework. It's like, why don't you take an hour or two to take the time to finish it and come back? Because it, it, it I mean, yeah. I don't understand why why uh, Frank Graves of Ecos released this because it was premature. Like the argument that 
with small sample size, you can have wonky numbers is entirely legitimate. Sometimes we see True. weird numbers in Atlantic Canada, in the prairies. But when you have something that is clearly wrong and a sample size that it's clearly too small, just release the Ontario numbers and say, oh, there's a federal pool of Ontario numbers then. Like I, if you release the whole thing and you have 12 cases in Manitoba, it's, it's sloppy. I don't understand. So that's what I had to say about uh, this poll. It, you know, again, it didn't change the overall picture. The, the numbers elsewhere were well within range of yeah. the current averages. It was fine, but it was unfinished. Yeah, I don't know why not just spend another night and have all the IVR dialers calling Saskatchewan, Manitoba. I don't, yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. Get another 40 respondents. You'll get a normal number, and then there you go. I don't know. I'm not sure why. And, and, and then also to make a thing out of the poll. If this was a weekly poll that Ecos was putting yeah. out, and this was the weekly results, and it was a weird result in Prairies, we'd be like, well, they, they're consistently putting out their numbers, so... Yeah. Um, good for them to put out stuff, even if even if it's it's different from what other people show. But I don't know why you would selectively put out uh, this kind of poll when you know it. Do, it Ecos is not regularly putting out polls. They're putting out polls kind of only when they're interesting, which I don't think is the way you should do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you should have the intention to release a poll before yeah. you actually even go into the field. That's right. Uh, That's exactly right. I don't right. think it should be based on what the what the results are showing. So we do not feel that there's anything happening in the federal landscape. Uh, we did get the new fundraising numbers, which I always enjoy. Yeah. You yeah. always seem to be bored by. Well. Um, <laughs> you know, yes, these were the third quarter numbers. So July, August, and September, 8.4 million for the Conservatives, 3.3 million for the Liberals, 1.3 million for the New Democrats. Really nothing all that out of the norm. That from what we've seen, the Conservatives keep putting up their best quarters on record, uh, this is their best third quarter outside of an election that they've ever had. Uh, the Liberals actually had a pretty good quarter yeah. by their standards, yep. up a little bit. The NDP was down, um, but I looked into the numbers, and it's interesting. I, ha I don't do it this often, so I don't know if I'm just selectively finding something interesting, but I looked at the day-to-day -day <laughs> donations from the New Democrats. You, we oh, know. Wow. Okay. Yes, I know. Yeah, this is what I do. This and, is the weird and, stuff. Okay. <laughs> Now, they only report, Elections Canada only reports the details of donations of over $200. So we don't know what all the small donors, when they donated, who they, you know, where they were. Uh, but two of the two days where the New Democrats had their best days, outside of the 15th and the end of the month, which I think is when their monthly charges go out for people okay. who are monthly donors, was the day they broke the CASA agreement. And the day that uh, Jagmeet Singh in the House of Commons said uh, to Pierre Polyev, I'm right here, bro. Oh. So I, I find that kind of interesting. Wow, so they ended really? September with decent fundraising. And I'm curious if actually that was carried through into the fall or not. But a little note there because their numbers were overall not very good. But they did have some spikes on what were kind of <laughs> days when they dominated the media coverage. <laughs> I don't know if that's funny or sad, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I'm. Ha I'm. I mean, if I told you, hey, I'm right here, bro. Come at me, and uh, our numbers on YouTube go up. Maybe uh, you don't know. It, it's interesting, but but that 3.3 million for the Liberals, again, I, I also looked at the the past trends. is pretty good. It's just that it's again overshadowed by a dominance of the Conservatives. And the Conservatives are, for this year, uh, I don't have the numbers in front, but I think they're over 40 million now, right? Or no, no 35 million. 29. 29. Okay, so yeah, so 10 million per, per quarter on average. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money for lots of advertising coming your way. Well, right now, but also throughout uh, until the next campaign, which will be... Soon. We'll see. June? J 29 say, million? Yeah. I said soon. I mean, yeah. months is soon. 29 million in yeah. nine months is already more than they've raised in every year except 2019, 2021, which were election years. And last year, when Pierre Poiliev was leader for the full year. So nine months, they've already raised more money than they usually do in an entire year. Yeah. An entire year. So that's, uh, that's why they have all that cash. And uh, those little digital ads that the liberals said they put up, I'm sure they're, it's like a pea shooter against a howitzer. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's going to take down any walls. It's going to move any numbers. Hmm. Nova Scotia. 
oh yes there's an election going on yes and i uh, yes. i i remember during that uh during the election night in the u.s i i i was thinking okay all right trump's gonna win let's move right away to to nova scotia <laughs> and we had polls we had we had data uh let me go through it uh eric so okay so three polls in the past week uh we had main street abacus data which has a new office in halifax which is a great news yeah, for us cool. uh and the liaison strategies and uh the pcs are leading everywhere but by different margins uh, liaison has a closer race the pcs at 38 abacus is right in the middle with 45 percent for the pcs and main street has 50 percent in the pcs and all three polls have the Liberals and the NDP roughly tied with a sl- small advantage of the, uh, for the NDP. But um, so, OK, so what are your first impressions of those numbers uh, near the, just after the starting line in Nova Scotia? Well, we're not seeing, at least initially, any sort of incumbency blowback against Tim Houston. As someone on the Discord made a good point. He was the first one to defeat an incumbent back in 21 when he defeated true. Ian Rankin. Yeah. Uh, the three polls have the NDP in second. In some polls, it's by a point. In other polls, it's by three. Uh, and the Liberals in a third. And pretty much, we don't know, uh, the regional numbers from Main Street were paywalled, but uh, both Abacus and Liaison, and I'm sure Main Street as well, has a closer race in Halifax, so the NDP doing well in Halifax. Yeah. The Liberals in second in the rest of the province, but behind by like 30 points. So the yeah. fact that they're... Second there is not going to win them lots of seats, whereas in Halifax, the NDP could actually make some gains, probably at the expense of the Liberals. And so my view right now, big majority for the PCs, NDP, official opposition, Liberals clinging to survival with a handful of seats at most. Yeah, the Liberals, I mean, with those numbers, they look like they will collect second places everywhere, huh? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, they had pretty good. I mean, I, th- I thought they had good numbers relatively uh, outside of Halifax, but finishing second everywhere doesn't bring you any seats. And so uh, we'll see how the campaign unfolds. But for now, I mean, it's clear that the PCs are on path to a second majority and an increased majority. Uh, but so but again, I'm very glad to see Abacus Data having an office now in, the, in Atlantic Canada. I think we'll get quality polls out of the region for that. And uh, and also not only IVR polls and nothing against IVR polls, mm-hmm. but it's good to have a good mix in there, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, looking forward to to see uh, how it goes, and of course there will be a debate. I think it's in soon, right? Next week, I think it was. I, I have to check this out. But uh, I was busy with the U.S. election. I will. We will focus on Nova Scotia for the rest of the month after this. Uh, yeah. It's we'll see. It, the overlap we'll live stream. The uh, well, election I mean, night. yeah. I, I, you know, Atlantic time, Eric. It's I know Atlantic time is the best. I love Atlantic time. It's so much more fun than BC time. Oh my goodness! Oh, B- BC uh, time was brutal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to move over to the quiz already? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, of course, we, the mailbag, as you know, our new format, the mailbag will be for uh, for uh, members of this podcast only on the Patreon. So and we'll do it at the end. But uh, let's move to the quiz. So Eric. You know, I like to do th- quizzes that are thematic. And so, mm-hmm. you know, with the honor of the, uh, the, the U.S. election, I, uh, I decided to give you a little quiz. And I ask you in advance, how well do you know your U.S. president? Do you know your, your, your presidential history south of the border? Are you good with that? I'm okay. You're okay. Okay, all right. Uh, here's the simple quiz. I will give you a prime minister north of the border in Canada, you have to tell me how many and which presidents overlapped the reign of that prime minister. Okay, so, that's good. I like that. You like that? Okay. And yeah, just like to make that. sure, I tried to, to avoid the confusion. I took election dates and not nomination dates. A nomination in the US now is January 20th, but it used to be in March, which when you think about it, it's really long, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I decided to take election dates. Uh, so, okay, I have five prime ministers. Um, and you can have uh, a free, uh, two free strikes at the third strike. You lose the point, but it's okay. not for each. It's for the, to- the whole quiz. So five prime ministers. Do you want to go forward in time or backwards in time? I like going backwards in time. You like going I like, backwards. I like that it gets more tricky. Okay. 
So it's going to start, I think, pretty easy, but it's going to get complicated. So let's go. All right. An easy one to start. Eric, Jean Chrétien. How many and which U.S. presidents overlapped the reign of Jean Chrétien? Okay, so Chrétien was there from 93 to 2003. Uh, so in so he had George W. Bush from uh, 2000 to 2001 to 2003. Before that, he had Bill Clinton, uh, who was uh, elected in 96 and first elected in 92. So I think the only he only had Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. Which is correct. You get the first point. Okay, we go back in time a little bit. Pierre Elliott Trudeau. How oh, many and which U.S. president overlapped the uh, prime ministership of Pierre Elliott Trudeau? And like, like Donald Trump, Trudeau had two, uh, two sequences in office, right? Yeah. Okay, so his second <laughs> term was 80 to 84. Uh, so he would have had Ronald Reagan, who was uh, elected in 1980. Um, in his uh, first, okay, so he would have had Jimmy Carter before that, when they overlap between 76 and 79, and then a little bit in 1980. Uh, before that, he would have had then uh, Gerald Ford, who replaced Richard Nixon. He would have had Richard Nixon. And mm. so Richard Nixon, okay, wait, so 76 was Carter, 72 was Nixon, 68 was Nixon. Uh, so he would have had... Yeah, just, yeah, so Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan. And if you're counting the first one, then he would have had as well um, uh, Lyndon Johnson for a couple of months. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. You are correct. So Pierre yes. Trudeau was elected in April 68, uh, which means that Lyndon B. Johnson was in office, then Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan for five presidents, right? Okay. He got Eric, along well with um, probably not some very of many them. of them. Some of, well, some of them. Not Nixon. I, not Nixon. Not get no. along well with Nixon. <laughs> uh, Eric, we are going back in time. John Diefenbaker. How many oh, presidents, yeah. which presidents overlapped the reign of John Diefenbaker? So Diefenbaker was in from 57 to 63. Um, so at the end of his time, he would have had uh, John F. Kennedy as his president. Now, so Kennedy was assassinated in November, and the 63 election, I think, was before November. So I think he would have only had uh, Kennedy. And they did not really see eye to eye. Uh, <laughs> well. Kennedy really didn't like Diefenbaker. Uh, and I don't think, I think it was... Uh, I think it was mutual. Uh, so before, so Kennedy comes in in 1960. So the president that would have been there before Kennedy would have been Dwight D. Eisenhower, the former uh, general. And uh, I think that's it. So two, Eisenhower and Kennedy. Wow. Okay. You're three for three. This is a good answer. Okay. So you got bronze already. You have All two right. left for gold. Let's see how Now it, it gets goes. tougher. My, my dates for the president start to get a little bit more fuzzier. Okay. Prime Minister R.B. Bennett. How many presidents did overlap and which ones? All right. So 1930, 1935 for R.B. Bennett. You know those Depression. dates. That's pretty good. Yep. Know those dates. Okay. So Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, comes in in 36. 36, he's reelected in 40, and then he runs for an unprecedented third term in 44. And wins and then dies uh, the year later. So, not Roosevelt. So, who was president in the 30s? 1932, I think, was Herbert Hoover. And I think in 28, it was Calvin Coolidge. So, it would have been Coolidge and Hoover. Okay, I give you one strike. Oh, Hoover, no. Hoover is correct. Okay, so it's not Coolidge. Uh, so, who was it then? Mm, in 28... Who was elected in 28? Oh, but, well. <laughs> hmm. uh, could it have been, uh, who else was back? Harding? Second strike. You can pass also, but you have a second strike. I'm going to pass because I don't know. I'm blanking. Okay. So, as you said, R.B. Bennett in office from 30 35. 
uh, Herbert Hoover was elected in 28. And in, oh, 32, was 30, in 32, it was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt oh, had four. Was. He had four wins. He had the 32, 36, 40, and 44. Oh, man, you're right. It's a long 30, 36, time. 44. And after Franklin wow. D. Roosevelt, uh, they passed the amendment that limit the term limits, right? Okay, so his third term was in 40. His third uh, win. Yep. 44, then he ran a fourth time. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Going for silver here. This is a good one here. A long-standing prime minister. I, I figured I could give you a Johnny McDonald, McDonald in here, but I don't know. I don't even know the full dates. I'm giving you a, a four-term prime minister. His name is Wilfrid Laurier. Mm. How many presidents overlapped Wilfrid Laurier? Over okay, that's you? good. Okay, so <laughs> 96 to... He was... Uh, Wilfrid Laurier was 1896 to 1911. That's correct. Okay. I got to go back in time. So Woodrow Wilson was president during World War I, but I think he was first elected in 1912. So he wasn't there. In 1908, it was... Um, uh, <laughs> I think it was... Oh, man. Okay, wait. So 96, <laughs> it was... In 1900, it was... In 96, it was McKinley. And then he got assassinated and was replaced. And I think he was reelected in 1900. And he was replaced by Teddy Roosevelt in 1902. So I got McKinley, Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt runs again in 1904 and he wins. He doesn't run again in 1908 and it goes to Howard Taft. And then in 12. Or I actually Roosevelt might have run in 1908 as a progressive, or was that in 1912? Um, so yeah, okay. So I'm going to say it was McKinley, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt, Howard Taft. Okay, so these three are correct, okay. but I, I'm missing you one? have your last strike because you're missing one. So last chance for you, you're missing one. I am missing one. Okay, so McKinley came in in 1900, and and then was assassinated in, in 02. Then it was Roosevelt. Then it was Taft. Um, so who was it in 1896? Grover Cleveland? Is that your final answer? Because the silver medal hinges on it. I think he was earlier. I don't think it was Cleveland, but I don't know. I don't know who it would have been in 96. So I'm going to say it was Cleveland. And it was Grover Cleveland, oh, who was in hey. office from 92 to actually March 97. But 96, he was replaced by McKinley, who was reelected in 1900. Then Teddy Roosevelt, then William Howard Taft. So four president. You get the point and you get Oof. the silver medal. So congratulations to you, Eric. Pretty good. What I'll was the that. only the, the only miss was R.B. Bennett, which I think is a tough period, especially with Roosevelt being there yeah. so long. So Coolidge was in... 24, I guess. Uh, let me look that up. I think so. Yes. Coolidge 24. was 24 and Harding right. was 20. Okay. That's right. All right. Hey, good performance by Eric. I can tell you that I would have, I would not have meddled in that quiz. Uh, I would have gotten the, the recent ones, the Chrétien et le Trudeau. Well, I, no, that's true. I would have gotten Diefenbaker. But uh, the other ones, I know you know the 20s and 30s very well. I don't. So... Uh, if you good, had asked me Johnny McDonald, I would have, I would not have managed that one. <laughs> they had a well, lot of presidents that I don't know their names of now. Well, feels like movie. a future quiz here, right there. Oh, so. No, four <laughs> years from now, we'll do it in four years. What is your number of the week, sir? My number of the week is very simple: fifty uh, percent. It looks like Donald Trump could get over 50% of the vote, which would be his highest share. Interestingly, the, the vote share for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020 was very similar. It was in a 46% range, right? So even though, I mean, the total number and the absolute number changes from uh, election to election, it looks like he will have his best election, uh, which I think defies a lot of predictions. Um, not mine. I had, you know, I had a close one, but sometimes you look at the numbers and your gut says a different thing. Uh, I looked at my numbers and, and said, there's no way Harris wins this, even though it's mm. so strange, but 50% is my, is my number of the week. What about you? So mine is 37. So this is the, uh, the amount of points in the difference between the net positive negative rating 
between Tim Houston and Justin Trudeau in Nova Scotia. So Ooh. this is from the Abacus, uh, Abacus data poll. Tim Houston has a net plus four rating. 38% have a positive view of him in Nova Scotia. 34 have a negative view. Justin Trudeau has a 23% positive rating in Nova Scotia and a 56% Oof. negative. So he's Ouch. a minus 33. So the difference between them is, a, is 37 points. And I think this explains pretty easily why Tim Houston wants to go to an election and wanted to go to an election while Justin Trudeau was still prime minister and why JT is in those ads with Zach Churchill of the Liberals, the Nova Scotia leader, that they want to tie them together uh, because Churchill is actually more popular in Nova Scotia than Trudeau is. Uh, So if he can bring down the Liberals even further, pad their majority, make sure the Liberals only get maybe one, two, three seats. Uh, So I think that that was a pretty revealing number. Also from the poll, only 29% of Nova Scotians have a positive view of Pierre Poilievre. 45% 45% had a negative view. So yeah. the three provincial leaders, all positives, all have positive ratings. The two main federal leaders have negative ratings in the province. So uh, interesting. We're, we're not always happy with all of our options. Oh, so no. that'll be uh, my number of the week. And uh, Philip, so it was a big week for us, though. We didn't actually chat as much. We, we were seeing each other almost every day for a little while there <laughs> with all those provincial campaigns. Uh, so it was really nice to chat with you. And we'll chat again in seven days. We are going to record our mailbag episode just uh, right next. So if you want to listen to that, we got lots of questions on the U.S. election, uh, some provincial stuff. And um, and that uh, I'm looking forward to actually answering some of them. I did a little bit of research for some of them. All right. I know. So if you want to listen to that, you can go to the numberspod.ca to join our Patreon, support our work, and get access to the mailbag every week. So, Philip, um, I'm looking forward to chatting with you in a few more seconds, but also in another week. Merci beaucoup, everybody. Have a great week. Head over to the Patreon for the mailbag. <laughs>